Hi, I'm Pastor Cheryl. Thank you so much for joining me today. The message today is titled, The Magi of the Christmas Story. Now, the Feast of Epiphany occurs 12 days after Christmas, and some Christian traditions celebrate this feast by placing the figures of the three kings into their nativity scenes. Some even delay putting up the Christmas tree until Christmas Eve to symbolically light the way for Jesus and then put away all the decorations on Epiphany to mark the end of the traditional Christmas time. We're probably all familiar with the Christmas carol, We Three Kings. The song tells of three kings from the Orient traveling to find the Christ child as they follow the star of wonder to Bethlehem. But were there three kings? What are the Magi? And, and did they show up with the shepherds in the manger scene as our nativity sets depict? Well, today we're going to take a look at the traditions surrounding Epiphany and the political atmosphere of Jesus' day. But first, before we get into the message, please join me for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for these folks who are listening to this message. Lord, I thank you for the message that you've given me. I pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would touch the hearts of every single person within the sound of my voice. And Lord, I pray that their lives would be changed for eternity because of the words that you have given me. We give you all the glory in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Okay, today's text is Matthew, starting in chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. I am reading from the Amplified Bible. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, or Herod the Great, Magi, wise men from the east, came to Jerusalem asking, Where is he who has been born the king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was disturbed and all of Jerusalem with him. So he called together all of the chief priests and scribes of the people and anxiously asked them, where the Christ, or the Messiah, the Anointed One, was to be born. They replied to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet Micah. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not in any way least among the leaders of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly sent for the Magi and learned from them the exact time the star had first appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go, go search carefully for the child, and when you found him, report to me, so that I too may come and worship him. After hearing the king, they went their way, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went on before them, continually leading the way, until it came and stood over the place where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And after entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. And then, after opening their treasure chests, they presented to him gifts fit for a king, gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to go back to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. This is the visit of the Magi, or the wise men. You know, in verses 1 and 2, we read, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, or Herod the great, Magi, wise men from the east, came to Jerusalem asking, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. After Jesus was born, these wise men came to look for him, probably from an area which is now either Iraq, Iran, Saudi Arabia, the Yemen, or an area in what's now southern Turkey nor or northern Syria. Although they are often called the three kings, the Bible doesn't say how many there were, or that they even were kings. One theory is that they may have been kings of the Yemen, as during this time the kings of Yemen were Jews. Three is only a guess, because they brought with them three gifts. 
But however many of them there were, they probably would have had many servants accompanying them. They were men of great learning. The word magi comes from the Greek word magos, where the English word magic comes from. Magos itself comes from an old Persian word, magupati, and this was the title given to priests in a sect of the ancient Persian religions such as Zoroastrianism. Today, we'd call them astrologers. But back then, astronomy and astrology were part of the same overall studies and was considered science. And it went hand, they went hand in hand with each other. The Magi would have followed the patterns of the stars religiously. They would have also probably been very rich and held in high esteem in their own society as well as by people who weren't from their country or their religion. The Magi would have known about the prophecies of a special Jewish Savior, also known as the Messiah, from when the Jews had been held captive in ancient Babylon several hundred years before. Now, scholars believe that their visit occurred when Jesus was between 40 days and two years old. The visit from these wise men show us that Jesus is worthy of royal honor from all humanity, and Gentiles as well as Jews are included in God's redemptive plan. Now the Magi naturally went to the court of Israel's reigning king, seeking to worship the newborn king of the Jews, much to Herod's distress. Verse 3, when Herod the king heard this, he was disturbed and all of Jerusalem with him. So he called together all the chief priests and scribes of the people and anxiously asked them where the Christ or the Messiah, the anointed, was to be born. And they replied to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet Micah. And you, Bethlehem, and the land of Judah, are not in any way least among the leaders of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. The chief priests were the temple ministers in charge of worship. The teachers of the law were copyists of scripture in post-exilic times. They were trained to teach and to apply the law. Together, the teachers of the law and the chief priests made up the Sanhedrin, or the Jewish Senate and Supreme Court. This body was composed of 70 or 71 men who were in charge of the civil and religious affairs of the Jews and who were given considerable authority under the Romans. Now, Herod the Great was a highly ambitious leader who would stop at nothing to advance and protect his position. According to the historian Josephus, Herod had gained the title King of the Jews by the Romans. He was granted the title, the King of the Jews, by the Roman Senate in 40 BC. Now, there was one problem to this. The Jews already had a king on the throne. Antigonus, who was from the old royal Hasmonesan family, Herod had him exi executed in 37 BC, which did not sit well with the Jews. Herod's title, King of the Jews, was marred by another problem to Herod's Jewish subjects. Herod was only half Jewish. His father was an Idumean from the south of Judea who had converted to Judaism. And his mother was the Arab princess Cyprus from Nabatea. Now Herod married Antigonus' granddaughter to bring some legitimacy to his reign as the Hasmonesan family had ruled Israel for many years. And he re rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem. Despite this, he tried to be a Roman to the Romans as well by putting pressure on the Jewish nation to accept Roman customs such as Greeks, Greek sporting games and temples dedicated to the emperor. Herod was distrustful, jealous, and brutal, ruthlessly crushing any potential opposition. The Jews never accepted him as their legitimate king, and this infuriated him. He constantly feared conspiracy. He executed his wife when he suspected she was plotting against him. Three of his sons, another wife, and his mother-in-law all met the same fate when they too were suspected of conspiracy. Herod, trying to be a legitimate Jew, 
would not eat pork, but he freely murdered his sons and anyone else that he felt stood in his way. This news of a newly born king of the Jews whew, sent Herod into a rage. Verse 7. Then Herod secretly sent for the Magi and learned from them the exact time that the star had first appeared. And then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search carefully for this child, and when you found him, report to me, so that I too may come and worship him. Yeah. Jealous and distrustful, ruthless and crushing any political opposition, Herod never intended to worship Jesus. Rather, he wanted to sniff him out and destroy him. Verse 9, after hearing the king, they, the magi, went their way, and behold, the star, which they had seen in the east, went before them, continually leading the way until it came and stood over the place where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. You know, scientists have been trying to figure out what this Christmas star actually was for hundreds of years. Some seem to think it was a planetary convergence. Others think it was a comet. Still others think perhaps it was a supernova. None of these natural phenomena travel through the sky and then stop in place. Which leaves the only explanation of the star being something supernatural. Hubert J. Bernhard, who for many years was a lecturer at San Francisco's Morrison Planetarium, made a series of four LP record albums in 1967, trying to educate and popularize astronomy. They were called the Planetarium Lecture Series, and one of his topics dealt with the Star of Bethlehem. Near the end of his lecture, Bernhard placed this discussion into perspective when he said, If you accept the story told in the Bible as literal truth, then the Christmas star could not have been a natural apparition. Its movement in the sky and its ability to stand above and mark a single building, these would indicate that it was not a natural phenomenon, but a supernatural sign. One given from on high and one that science will never be able to explain. Picking it up again in verse 10. When they, the Magi, saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And after entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, after opening their treasure chest, they presented to him gifts fit for a king, gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. You know, it sometimes feels that our nativity sets with the little figurines of the Holy Family, the sheep, the shepherds, and angels, and the wise men with their camels, kind of resembles a Reader's Digest condensed book. All of the key players are there, but the storyline is compressed. When the wise men found Jesus and Mary, they would, they would have been living in a normal house, probably in Bethlehem or Jerusalem. Now, it's possible that the Holy Family was living with relatives now that the census crowds had gone home, or in a rented house, assuming that Joseph had found work there to support his family. We know that they were not financially well off because of their offering at the temple when baby Jesus was presented at the temple, according to the Gospel of Luke. Now, the Magi gave their gifts to Jesus, gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. These gifts seem quite strange to give to a baby. But Christians believe that they had the following meanings. Gold is associated with kings, and Jesus is the king of kings. Frankincense is sometimes used in worship, and Jesus deserves our worship. And then there's myrrh. Myrrh is used as an embalming spice for dead bodies. This gift showed that Jesus would suffer and that he would die. Verse 12. And having been warned by God in a dream not to go back to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. Now, turn to Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 18. Beginning in verse 13. Now when they, the Magi, had gone... 
an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod intends to search for the child in order to destroy him. So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother while it was still night, and they left for Egypt. He remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken to the prophet Hosea. Out of Egypt, I called my son. So what happened to the gifts presented to Jesus by the wise men? Scripture doesn't say. Clearly, they reflect the Magi's worship of Christ at his birth. And we can guess that they may have provided the means for his family's flight to Egypt, probably booking a last-minute passage on a caravan. The angel's warning and instructions to Joseph were sudden and unexpected. There was no time to save enough money for such a long journey, even if saving was an option. This family was poor. These costly gifts probably represented more wealth than either Mary or Joseph had seen in a lifetime. God promises to provide what is necessary for his children and to care for their needs. These offerings of worship may, may well have paid for a journey to Egypt and helped set up a new life in a strange land. Now the Bible doesn't tell us where the family stayed. Perhaps they were absorbed into the one million Jews estimated to have lived in Alexandria at that time. Wherever they ended up, we know that Jesus spent at least some of his formative years in Egypt, displaced from his homeland. And when his family migrated back to Palestine, they didn't settle in a privileged neighborhood. Instead, they settled in Nazareth, in rural Galilee. Herod's attempt to kill Jesus and God's way of protecting the child reveal several truths about God's method of guiding and protecting his people. God did not protect Mary and Joseph and their child without their cooperation. They could have stayed in Bethlehem and said, no, we'll stay and we'll just trust God to protect us. No, instead they heeded the angel's warning. Protection requires obedience to God's guidance, which in this case involved fleeing the country. God may allow some things that are hard to understand to enter our lives in order to accomplish his will. In our limited understanding, be easier. it just seems like the whole thing would have been easier if God had removed Herod immediately, avoiding the escape to Egypt and all the trials surrounding that circumstance. And even after a particular trial is resolved, there may be other problems to face. God's protection and his providential care will always be needed because the believer's enemy never stops his attacks on the faithful. Verse 16, when Her then Herod, when he realized that he had been tricked by the Magi, was extremely angry, and he sent soldiers and put to death all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that area who were two years old and under, according to the date which he had learned from the Magi. Then what had been spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they were no more. In verses 16 through 18, we read of an entire village of baby boys being slaughtered due to the insane rage of a jealous king. Bethlehem and its population were not large. It was most likely about one or two thousand people. Scholars estimate the number of male children slain would have been around 20. The weeping and wailing in Bethlehem must have gone on for days. It could not have been quickly silenced. Now, Jesus can offer particular comfort to those who grieve the loss of a child. In effect, the babies of Bethlehem died for him. He must have carried that pain, the pain of that throughout his life and onto the cross. It most likely shaped his special concern for children. 
Expressing grief is an important part of our healing. You know, today some people wish to appear strong and they try to hide their feelings. Expressing our grief can help us deal with our intense sorrow when a loved one dies. Our grief can also place us at the crossroads of our faith, shattering many misconceptions about God, such as, while God will make you rich, he will always keep you from trouble and pain, and he will always protect your loved ones. God may not keep us from troubles and trials, but he will walk with us through them. Know that Jesus understands our grief. We serve a God who cares. So today we've looked at the political world which Jesus was born into, the incredible gifts from the Magi and how they provided for the Holy Family's flight to safety, as well as Herod's unreasonable slaughter of innocent children as he tried to murder the newborn king of the Jews. We've also seen that God's protection requires our obedience, that we will always need God's protection, and that he will walk with us through our trials. Do you seek the newborn king of the Jews? Do you worship Jesus? Is he your Lord and Savior? He's no longer the baby in the manger or the little child receiving gifts from the Magi. In fact, he is seated now at God's right hand, interceding for us, and will return any day now for his bride, the church. I want you to be a part of that. But you must first ask Jesus to be your Lord. You must repent of your sins, and you must promise to follow him, living life by his rules. Now, if the Holy Spirit is knocking on your heart right now, please pray along with me. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sins. Please become Lord of my life. Help me live by your rules. Please save me. Amen. If you prayed this prayer for the very first time today, please email me at CherylPickford at gmail.com. I want to help you get started in your new walk with Jesus. So we wrap up this wonderful Christmas season with Epiphany. And I hope that next Christmas, when you set up your nativity scene, you take a moment and reflect on today's message. Until we meet again, may God bless you abundantly.